please welcome Sonder CEO and co-founder Francis Davidson in discussion with Skiff Travel tech editor Sean O'Neill. So welcome again to the Skift uh, Short-Term Rental Summit. Uh, we're featuring Sonder first. So why Sonder? Um, it's not just because it has raised $360 million, although that, that doesn't hurt, and it puts it ahead of many of its competitors, uh, all of its competitors. Uh, it's not just because it has 3,500 units uh, in operation and uh, about 10,000 in the pipeline. Uh, it's because it's urban, tech-led, professionally managed, uh, and it is sort of represents the center of gravity about what we'll be talking about throughout today. So we're grateful to have Francis uh, Davidson from the uh, CEO of Sonder. Thank you so much You're for awesome. joining us. Um, so you've talked a lot about tech-led hospitality. What do you mean by that? Um, I think uh, you know the question is like, is is this industry of Sonder a technology company? Um, and I think you know we don't sell software. Uh, we don't. We're not a SaaS company. Uh, we sell experiences, we're a hospitality brand, mm -hmm. an operator, um, but a critical component to our success, I mean, the, the very premise of our existence is predicated on uh, being, you know, amazing technologists. Uh, so we have right now, if we're a you know, technology you know, uh, team is over 100 people, um, and every part of the business, which is basically finding real estate, mm -hmm. onboarding it, making it ready for guests, the daily operations, the revenue management, you know, at every layer um, in order for, for this whole thing to work, uh, to offer you know just really amazing spaces at prices that are that are affordable, uh, technology uh, needs to be you know incorporated at every at every part of uh, the, the journey. Okay, that makes sense. Maybe you could give an example. You you have operationally facing technology, of consumer facing technology. So maybe paint a picture of how you use uh, your internal tech stack to you know source properties and then turn it to the brand standard. Certainly. Um, so I think you know one piece that's that's critical for our business to work, especially as a you know, given that we're taking on some level of risk through leases, is to have a really clear picture of what kind of revenue we can generate, all the way down to um, payback periods, IRRs on certain kinds of projects. So uh, there's a lot of data science that goes uh, towards that, and just kind of aggregating also real estate data sources to see what are the pieces of real estate that are most interesting to us. Um, uh, probably the, the 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 magic, I think, that something that we've invested pretty early on is um, uh, the kind of global supply chain and logistics infrastructure. Okay. Uh, so you know, at the snap of a finger, we can you know, within days, take a property that's empty to one that's ready to welcome a guest, um, you know, uh, sourcing furniture and decoration and so on uh, overseas. And then we have distribution centers that we use our own kind of technology stack to run and operate. And I think that allows us to spend a minimal amount of capital to set up a new property. I think that's one of the reasons why we've been able to grow so rapidly and have so many properties, um, you know, is that the, 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 qu the quantity of capital we have to deploy in order to, 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 to make a property ready and, and meet our standards is, is really low. Um, and so uh, that wouldn't be possible without kind of the tech stack. Um, and then you know everything that powers the operations day to day, like our, through our app, for instance, like you can you can request an early check in or a late mm -hmm. checkout. And so that's the consumer facing piece. But there's actually way more work behind the scenes to actually make that happen and update the codes and so on. I imagine. Um, so technology is clearly a competitive advantage that in your eyes. Uh, some critics would say that technology is a, a treadmill that once you get on it in order to be able to stay up to date and best in class year after year, you're going to have to keep investing in it. And that will require sort of like a, a very strong fat margin structure. Uh, and right now, the you know, right now there's a supply and demand mismatch. So right now there's not enough supply in some of these urban markets. So you're able to generate, you know, maybe fat margins. But historically, the hospitality industry hasn't really sustained tech level, you know, margins. So do you feel like how, why do you feel confident that it's a competitive advantage to bring this tech in-house when a lot of hospitality companies, they tend to outsource it? Yeah, um, I think you know, that's probably the Achilles heel of the hospitality industry. Uh, I think especially if you start looking at the cost structure of operating a hotel, deconstruct a hotel P&L and you'll see that you know, a really large fraction of those expenses could, could, could vanish if you were to build technology into it, let, let alone, you know, aside from that, there's amazing experience benefits um, of streamlining you know, through technology. But, um, I'd say you know it's it's a it's simple math exercise. It's corporate finance 101. You know you spend you know a few million dollars building a piece of technology. All right, automated check-in, and then you look at the stream of you know cash flows that that generates over time in terms of you know um, efficiencies at the property level. Uh, the paybacks are ridiculously rapid, and it's actually I'd say the reason why the technology hasn't been built into the core hospitality like kind of the, the large chains uh, doesn't relate actually to the fact that investments uh, you know are are not are nonsensical. Uh -huh. It's it's related to the idea that if you're a, a brand operator and you're a franchisor, 
um, you don't suffer from you know, a bloated cost structure at the property level. In fact, you want the hotels to be as expensive as possible because you're taking a <laughs> slice of the top line. And so building technology to reduce the cost structure would potentially actually be detrimental to the lifetime value of your franchise contract. So I think it's a misalignment of incentives. It's the fact that a hotel isn't operated by one entity. Uh, it's you know, the conjunction of you know, potentially a REIT and a management company and a flag. Um, and, and they have different kinds of incentives that I think for the last four years have really slowed down innovation in this space. All right, fascinating, provocative thesis. Uh, let's call up the slide from Dallas about the Rastigar effort. So what is going on in, in Dallas? Um, I think it, it, just one example of, uh, this is I think a 270 unit uh, building um, that's, uh, you know, uh, is gonna be ready a, a few years from now. It's an example of, of you know, uh, properties that, that, that are being, that are under construction today in, in you know, a few dozen markets uh, where developers have thought that, you know, by partnering with Saunders, they could achieve, you know, far superior returns than any other kind of use. Um, well, let's, bu let's build on that. So master lease is a concept we're gonna hear a lot throughout the day as a term. So how does Saunders master lease efforts help uh, property developers and your, your supply partners optimize their investments, you know? Yeah, um, so it really, it, you know, the, the answer depends really on the kind of, uh, you know, deal that we're looking at, because now, as, as uh, Fat mentioned, we, we do both apartments uh, and we have also hotels. Um, so the value proposition is a little bit different, but I'd say, you know, the core is that if you're building a property and, you know, uh, you have basically a tenant that will take, that will lease the entire building from you, and you know that months before the delivery of the property, um, then, uh, you know, the risk, the lease up risk is reduced uh, significantly. It takes about 18 months to lease up a building, whereas now if, if you look at what we've, last quarter, 73% of the units that we've signed on actually Saunders operates the entire building. And so that means that you start with full occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, it also means that, you know, 18 months in, you, there's still an advantage because instead of operating at, call it 95% occupancy, you're operating at 100. There's okay. this whole, whole series of costs that go away that we take on. And so if you contrast kind of the NOI that a property generates, well, you know, without a Sonder master lease versus, um, you know, just kind of whatever would be uh, uh, market, uh, there's usually a 10 to 20% lift. Uh, so it's really substantial. It's a deal, it's, it's, it's game changing, especially if you kind of look at the equity returns like the, of, the, of the developers, it's, it's, it's really a game changing value proposition. It's the reason why we've been able to sign on like, close to 14,000 units now. Cool. Uh, later today, we're gonna hear from the AHLA, which is the Hotel Lobby Association. Uh, should Sonder be a member of that organization? Um, I'm not sure we have anything to announce on that front today, uh, but it's true that you know we are in the hotel business today. We have um, 26 hotels uh, that that we have. Uh, so that paid. means they're licensed by the local authorities, running as a hotel. Yeah, that's actually even just hotel properties. We have even more than 26 that are licensed as hotels that aren't a traditional hotel product or more kind of a you know an apartment suite-like experience. Okay. Um, and we have you know another 70 hotels currently under negotiation. Um, and so we are, you know, a hotel operator in addition to also being kind of a short-term rental operator. So I think it's, it's all, it's really natural for us to kind of, you know, align with the industry on that front. Okay. About 15 years ago, there was a boutique hotel trend. We had Ian Schrager uh, at our Skiff Global Forum in New York. Uh, do you feel like the Sonder and your peers are sort of the equivalent wave? We'll be looking back 15 years that that's sort of like what, how boutique was before. Um, I mean, I can only speak for our ambition, uh, which is to be, you know, an iconic consumer brand full stop. Um, and, um, you know, along with the, the Nikes and the Disneys and the Apples, that's really kind of the long-term ambition of the company. And we want to do this across all accommodation categories. We think there could be, you know, a globally recognized brand that operates hotels and apartments and villas in any accommodation category. Um, and so I think what we're trying to, you know, achieve our aim is actually to be the next generation Marriott or Hilton, um, you know, and be, 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 um, you know, not, not, not simply on the, you know, a trend or, a, you know, a short-term rental operator, but rather to rethink the entire hospitality business, you know, from a, from a consumer perspective, but also, you know, thinking through how technology can reshape its operations. Okay. Well, I want to build on that. You say the consumer perspective. So you've used the phrase direct to consumer hospitality. So, and direct to consumer, a lot of times you talk about, you know, eyewear providers or mattress providers who go direct. So what's the, how does that metaphor work for you? Um, it's under. I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what's really important for us is that people that stay with us really love the experience. We've kind of been agnostic with regards to whether we have a, you know, we directly acquire that customer and they stay on, you know, they book through Sonic.com the first time or whether it's through, um, you know, our, 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 our distribution partnerships. Um, 
what's really important for us is that like you know they just love it. And frankly, um, it's something that we've seen also in the in the traditional hospitality industry in that you know there's a there's a wide breadth of distribution channels that that it makes sense to to, to work with at scale. Even if to go back to the Apple example, you know they sell a ton of iPhones through Best Buy and Verizon, and so I think. Um, you know what matters at, at the end of the day is really to, to provide an outstanding experience to back that with great operations so that the business can, can, can be financially viable. Okay. Uh, when I've talked to people about Sonder and your peers, one thing that comes up is people are a bit skeptical. They, they believe that there's an arbitrage that you're having to do and you're able to take advantage of a particular economic climate right now of uh, where there's a supply demand mismatch in certain urban markets. There is uh, you know, ch a cheap money uh, area where at the peak of an economic cycle and uh, you know you're you're uh, you know twice as smart as me, but you know half as young as me. And I've been through uh, you know a couple of recessions, and and we're in an audience here with a lot of financiers, a lot of uh, investors. Uh, uh, we've got we're going to have some people from Blackstone on stage later. We've got people who are uh, online travel executives, and a lot of these people are a bunch of sharks. You know, I mean, uh, thank you for buying the tickets, uh, but uh, <laughs> some of these people, you know, you know, stole my lunch money in school. You know, I mean, they're tough. So when you when you when you do these con Contracts. Why do you feel confident that they're not going to get the better, you know, ahead of you in, in, in the years to come? Yeah, I think this is a really important point, and that actually, if uh, you know, if we're not careful about it, it, it could be very dangerous. Okay. Um, but uh, so it's it's basically a portfolio risk management approach. Um, so there are, I think, um, you know, some uh, ways to mitigate some of these some of these effects. So you know, one thing that, that we've spoken about is. Um, you know, our leases, the vast majority of them, I think last quarter was over 80%, include a reduction in rent in the case of a recession. Uh, we've also looked at, you know, the data for hotel rev, like RevPARs going back 100 years. And every time, you know, every time we reforecast the business, you look at if an 08, 09 scenario occurs where peak to trough is an 18% drop, what happens to our P&L, to our contribution margin, to our EBITDA, our cash balance, and so on. And we manage the business with that in mind. Um, so I think it's about figuring out you know, what kind of lease durations we want to have, uh, what kind of contribution margin buffers we want to have, what kind of provisions exist if the markets go under. One thing to, you know, con to keep in mind as well is that right now, you know, it's also potentially, you know, 11 year bull cycle rents, right? So the cost structure is all, so the, the business model, the returns work despite extremely high rents, On both right? sides of the equation, and so factors, And right? so, yeah. and we've also looked at how these move over time and how mm -hmm. they're correlated and so mm -hmm. on. Um, so I don't think we would have raised, you know, four hundred million dollars had had we not had a solid answer. I think there's even a recession deck and basically modeling that's really sophisticated on that front. So risk management has to be a core capability of these businesses. Right. Um, and you know, if poorly done, then absolutely it can be the kiss of death of an organization. But if done in a really smart way, it can really accelerate, you know, the growth of the business and and and, and make it really thrive. So WeWork has been much in the news, and in a sense, the master lease model is kind of like what WeWork was doing, only it was for office space, and the office le leases were longer, and so there's differences. But was there anything about what WeWork has done that has you, sort of a lesson that you've internalized at Sonder? Um, you know, I think uh, the writing was on the wall. Um, if you operate a business that has poor unit economics, that doesn't have you know, really great risk management mm -hmm. and kind of underwriting hurdles, um, and uh, if you have governance issues, I mean, we could go on and on about right. some of the red flags that, that were there. Um, so I think it's just a, you know, a gentle reminder that uh, path to profitability or profitability is extremely important. Financial discipline, great governance, like, you know, it's just a, it's, uh, you know, uh, best practices, like, you know, it's, it, I think it's commonsensical. And that's something that we embedded in our business really early on. And we even released our Series D deck in which we showed kind of the progress of unit economics that we went through in 2018, right? So we, we saw that. 24 months ago, we were like, hey, we, we, you know, we need to make the economics like even stronger because yes, we're 10 years into a bull cycle, uh, and next year, you know, similar story. Like we just keep on, you know, uh, driving initiatives that that improve margins, and improve payback periods, and, and position us for, um, you know, uh, you know, hopefully one day. A really positive reception from the public markets. Okay, and you focused heavily on multifamily kind of units, a lot of contiguous units. Is there a reason for that strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Like I mentioned, over 70% of the buildings we saw in last quarter were full buildings. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the experience is better for guests. Uh, I think the returns are better for owners. I think operationally it's easier for us and there's better economies of scale. So, like, all things point in the same direction. 
uh, when it comes to increased concentration. If it's not full buildings, then you know, segments of buildings. So, you know, one of our buildings in New York here, 20 Broad, I think we have about 260 units in a 500 unit building. We have our own elevator bank. Uh, we're about to build our own entrance for that building. So uh, I think uh, you know, having great control over common areas and so on and is, 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 is critical. So I think it's, a, it's just a, a, normal, a normal path of uh, you know, evolution for the business. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that you mentioned a little bit earlier is that you, you're sort of a bit agnostic about how you acquire the customer. How important is brand marketing for the Sonder brand name and spending on that for your you know, next five years or so or whatever timeline you have? So we haven't, we haven't spent on marketing. Okay. Um, uh, you know, not not a dollar on customer acquisition marketing. Uh, it's actually pretty shocking, given that also over thirty percent of our revenue is direct. Uh, you know, mostly about thir about thirty percent of your revenue is direct. Over, over thirty percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. At this point, uh, fastest growing channel, and it's completely organic. Like wow. we don't even have a team that's working on that number. It's not even a company goal, an OKR. <laughs> it just happens. People love the experience. They go on our website. That's what happens. Um, and so. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really like I mentioned, great experience leads to people coming again, like back and 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 telling their you know their friends in their circle. Okay, I have a thought leadership question for you. So in the past, uh, th there's about a dozen uh, price setting soft startups and companies out there that help uh, professionally managed rental companies uh, set their rates. Uh, uh, Beyond pricing, I think, is the one that has raised the most, but there's, there's several of them out there. You've chosen to build that internally. How do, you, do you have an opinion on how that market is going to shake out based on certain dynamics? Do you feel like there's going to be consolidation? Do you feel there's enough need for, for all those tools? Um, I'm not carefully studied when it comes to that question. I sure. think there's some great teams working on awesome technology, and it makes all the sense in the world. I'd say not just for the short-term rental industry, but for hotel pricing in general. Like There's such opportunities to use you know, machine learning, data science to... to, to to improve, you know, rev pars through great pricing. So I, I'm a total believer in kind of the value proposition of these of these companies. I, I, I you know, I'm, I, I, I think they should. There's a bright future for them. Okay. And M and A for Sonder is that going to be part of your strategy? Um, you know, we 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 were always open minded, and you know, balance sheet is really strong, and so that's 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 a potential. Uh, we're expanding aggressively across Europe right now. It's about a dozen markets that are in flight in Europe, uh, and I think four or five in EMEA that are active today. Um, so you know, we're always on the lookout for you know great teams and uh, you know for uh, great portfolios uh, that we might be able to to, to, to roll into our brand. Um, you know, no acquisitions done so far, but uh, you know we're definitely open-minded. Uh, so we'll be hearing from hotel companies later today. I mean, presumably hotel companies have decades of experience about delivering hospitality. So do they have a, an inherent advantage when it comes to sort of like playing in this market compared to an upstart like you? I think there's some things that hotel, traditional hotel companies do extraordinarily well and that we have to study and learn from. Um, I think there is also a series of other things where their co core capabilities really don't position them well to build a great app and to build great you know, customer service automation and to really rethink profoundly the operations of a property. Um, so um, you know, our view is that you know, even though we're attempting to revolutionize the industry, really, um, we, we, we should bring on people on our team, which we have done. We've hired folks from, from Hilton and from the Four Seasons and so on. I think we should learn everything that there is, uh, but then have a fresh perspective, you know, blank sheet of paper and ask ourselves, you know, if we were to rethink it, how would we do it in a way that would drive the best possible experience in the most efficient manner? Um, and what we're realizing is that the vast majority of the way in which a hotel is, op like the ways in which a hotel is operated today, um, you know, uh, doesn't, doesn't map to the way that we think it, sh it should occur. And so, so most of it is reinvention, I'd say. Uh, things like housekeeping and how to optimally do a bed, I think, mm -hmm. has been figured out. And so <laughs> this we just need to become better at. Uh, but the majority of what happens when you, you know, find real estate, prepare it for guests, operate day-to-day, -day, revenue management, and so on, uh, it can be done way better. Okay. Uh, last question. So in uh, Miami recently, you, uh, you announced you're doing a deal that it's a particular, uh, it's like a true hotel is going to come online built from start. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you perceive the balance? You're sort of, you've got a couple of different business models, it seems like. Uh, is, it, is it, some people would say it's best to focus on a core competency, or is your strat the idea that it's more of a portfolio approach? Um, yeah, so uh, it's, uh, we launched our first hotel actually just almost 12 months ago. Okay. Um, and by hotel, I mean like there are hotel rooms. There's no living room. There's no kitchen. It's a you know 350 square foot room. Gotcha. Um, and uh, but we redesign these hotels and we you you operate them using our, our technology and our kind of very particular operating processes. 
Um, and yeah, today we have, we have 20, I think 25 or 26 hotels and 70 under negotiation. It's, our, it's an extremely fast, I think 17x like year over year at this point, off of a small base obviously, but it's expected to be about a quarter of our, of our total supply by the end of next year that's live. Um, so uh, we really love the model. We think that, you know, uh, we didn't actually realize that by building the infrastructure to operate a great short term rental company, that we could also transpose that into a hotel and actually drastically improve its performance. Uh, improve the guest experience, increase the rev par, and radically decrease the operating costs of these hotels. So it's possible for us to go to hotel owners, take a look at their PL, and literally guarantee them more profit than what they're currently generating, and still on the other side, generate you know, really great margins from the fact that, that we can bring in you know, these, these efficiencies. So we really love that business model. We also you know, spoke to a lot of our customers, and you know, when they were just staying for a business trip for just 48 hours or 24 hours, they, did, they felt it was like unnecessary to have this 800 square foot thing. Mm -hmm. um, they felt like they were splurging. Um, and so for us, it's really important also to you know, have a really great range of options that includes both uh, you know, hotels and, and, and the apartment format. Okay, Francis, thank you so much for explaining about Sonder. Have a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.